Tonight, let's get back into John. Studies in John. This is our eighth lesson, and we are in the first chapter. And uh, we are just, I was thinking about this today. I do actually think about the pace a little bit, believe it or not. Um, I think about going, am I going fast enough or should I be covering this? And I, you know, it just kind of struck me today of how much fun I'm having getting to do what I've always sort of wanted to do. And that's just literally take my time, treat it almost like a podcast that lasts about an hour every week and just journey through this book. And so the feedback has been off the charts, man. People are just enjoying this slow journey through this great gospel of John. So I don't know how far we'll get tonight. Let's start by reading several verses out of the gate. John chapter 1, verses 29. I'm going to read up through 36, and then we will start the work on some of these passages. <clears throat> the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And my title tonight is Behold the Lamb. Because I want to hone in later, in just a moment rather, on what John is trying to say to us and why this is a significant passage. The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. That first phrase, the first five words, I did not know him, will repeat themselves in a couple of verses. And there's a reason why. John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him. There it is again at the top of 33, John repeating the phrase, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. There's a John the Baptist connection between behold the Lamb of 29 and the Son of God of 34. Again the next day John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God, and there's the repeat so we were gonna, I'm going to sort of frame tonight's thoughts around that 29th verse and that 36th verse. Behold the Lamb. This is John the Baptist just declaring, behold the Lamb. He sees him come over the horizon. He physically sees the man Jesus. Please note that John has known Jesus since they were little boys because John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. And, but John has told you twice, I didn't know him, I didn't know him. And John doesn't mean I had never met the guy. John means I've known him my whole life, but I never knew him as this until today. I've known him as my cousin since we were little kids, but I've never called him Lamb of God. There was never a moment in our lives where I realized that my cousin was the Savior of the world. And so this is a revelation happening in the moment to John the Baptist. I think for me, this debunks some of the Hollywood theory that Jesus was as a little kid performing miracles for the community. You know, he's making little birds out of dust and some of the things you've seen in movies or read in books. Um, John really, I think, kind of works against that idea. That G, And he really works against it because when you get to the second chapter, John specifically tells you, here comes his first miracle. And so it's like John's trying to, to lay out this case that Jesus was a, a man in the community until he was more than that. Because at one point, he's just a guy that everybody knows as Jesus, as Mary's kid, or Jesus of Galilee, or Jesus who used to live in Nazareth, or Jesus whose family went down to Egypt when he was a little kid. He's not the miracle-working Jesus, and that's a profound thing when you consider that at age 12, according to the book of Luke, he knew who he was. Mom, I'm about my father's business. So you've got Jesus from 12 to Jesus of about age 30, who doesn't perform any miracles, who, who doesn't do all of the things that seems like the Son of God ought to do. Well, I'll get into some of the reasons for that as we go over the, over the coming weeks as to why I think Jesus doesn't do any of those miracles until he's of full age. But I just want to stay with John's thought here of letting the audience know that he doesn't reveal him as Son of God out of the gate. It's not as if everyone knew who he was. John says, behold, 
the Lamb of God. And what we're really doing is building off of, because we're, we're taking our time, so we're really kind of slowly trotting through chapter 1. And if you'll remember, John, on, at the end of last week, we talked about John the Baptist says, there's one coming who's preferred before me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to reach down and take off. In other words, I, I'm nothing compared to what's coming. You guys think my ministry is impressive, he said, but there's one coming. I don't know who he is. But I can tell he's coming because I'm here to prepare the way for him. Or as we taught last week, and I don't think John saw himself as Elijah, but you and I can see him as Elijah. If I'm Elijah, there's Elisha coming. If you think Elijah's ministry is good, wait till you see the next guy. And so John has that sense of, man, I'm here for a reason, but I know I'm not the guy. And so he says, there's one coming. I don't know who he is. And then you get this moment of the next day at the top of 29 where, and I want to point this out because John's gospel is one of the least chronological gospels of all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke. They like to take you day to day to day. In fact, there's some moments in, I think, Mark's gospel that walks you through a 48-hour period of the life of Jesus over like four chapters. I mean, it's just like, and then, and then, and then, and then. John doesn't do that. John is very rarely chronological. In fact, there's really heavy evidence that even in chapter one, he jumps ahead and back and head and back and head and back. He doesn't, he's not trying to write a chronological rendering of the life of Christ. He's trying to hit the highlights that were missed by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's trying to give you the stories that are relevant to the, to bringing someone into faith in Christ. And so when you get a next day, it's worth paying attention to because he doesn't throw them in willy nilly and they're rare. So for John to say the next day, John the Baptist, that tells us that John the Baptist has been preaching this message of, hey, I'm not the final guy. I'm a guy, but I'm not the final guy. There's one coming. I don't know who he is. I don't know when he's going to show up. He's preferred before me. I'm not worthy to reach down and unlatch his shoes. Next day comes, John the Baptist is back doing the same thing. He's baptizing people going, hey, I'm not the guy. The guy's coming. And then there's this behold exclamation point moment. Behold. There he is, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And then really from this point on, John's gospel is up and running. Because as slow as we've moved into it, everything's been intro. Just sort of descriptively talking about Jesus. And then here he comes on the scene. And John's first thought is to say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The fact that John says this first to me is very interesting because John is last. This should have been early on. You've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke who wrote their Gospels sometime in the 50s, possibly as late as the early 60s, A.D. So the temple falls in 70, which means genealogical records, priestly sacrificial ceremony, all that vanishes around 70. There's a real vacuum, as you can probably imagine, in Judaism around 70 A.D., where it takes Judaism a while to sort of make a comeback, and it will, Within 50 years, there's actually another Jewish-Roman civil war in the 120s. But Christianity and Judaism really take a really hard split around AD 70 because there's nothing to go back to. So if you're a Christian who used to be a Jew, there's no more lamb. You can't kill another lamb. What are you going to do? So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke in the 50s and the 60s. The fall of the temple, John comes along and writes his gospel last He's the first gospel writer to call Jesus Lamb of God. So no one in the 50s did. No one in the 60s did. The 70s, the temple comes down. John comes along probably the 80s, the 90s, or at least post-temple. That we can be fairly sure of. And John says, let me tell you the Jesus I remember. Matthew didn't call him this. Mark didn't call him this. Luke didn't call him this. And shockingly enough, Paul didn't call him this. And Peter kind of called him. I'll get into a couple of those in a second. But I'm going to introduce him as the lamb, not a lamb, not not like a lamb. I'm going to introduce him as the lamb that takes away all sin, the ultimate sacrifice. I'm saying this post-temple. So the temple's gone. Can't kill lambs anymore. But I want to present to you that Jesus is the lamb. And so John writes it last, which I find pretty cool because... It tells me that in that first century, the theological development of the early church is slowly happening. They're getting, and please forgive this statement, it's going to sound worse than I mean it, they're getting smarter as they go. 
And I don't mean that they're stupid or that they're even ignorant, but they, as the Holy Spirit starts to reveal to them things, they get better. Like, watch, look at the early part. Of, read the book of Acts when you sometime. And you look at Peter preaching Acts 2 and then read 1 Peter. They're not the same guy. I mean, his theology's rounded in 1 Peter. His theology in Acts 2 is kind of like, hey, you guys killed Jesus. And you need to get it right. And a bunch of people get saved. And it's really, it's really shallow theology compared to where he ends up. Well, why is that? Well, it's because we grow. We grow in our understanding of the word. We grow in, in who we are in the Holy Spirit. We grow in, and that's why you can, you know, relax when people don't line all the theological things up because maybe they're on that road and they're getting there and we give them a little bit of, we give them some rope. We give them, give them a leash a little bit, give them some, a chance to expand and, so, but John coming at the end, he's got it. I mean, there's not more to get. He, he, he's the gospel of the Holy Spirit. He's the gospel of Jesus as lamb. It's like the two apex things of Christ's ministry. A man possessed of the spirit who takes that spirit out and reproduces himself in the world. That's the whole motif of John is new creation, recreation in the beginning. And a Jesus who comes as the ultimate sacrifice. The lamb at the end of the run of lambs. I mean, by the time the temple falls in AD 70, there have been over 2 billion lambs sacrificed. Jesus comes as the ultimate lamb of lambs, or what John would call him the lamb of God. So it's easy to brush over this. We're, we're reading it 2,000 years later. And we go, oh, the whole lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is a lamb. When John writes it, no one had ever thought to write that down. And Jesus has been gone for a half a century and no one ever thought to write down he was the ultimate lamb that took away not just Israel's issues, but the temple's gone now while I'm writing this. He did more than the temple. Let me, let me use a temple image of a lamb. He did better than a temple. Behold the lamb of God that takes away the whole issue of the sin of the world. Now, I'll take you to where I know John gets it because that's, that's my journey as a Bible student is I want to know where you got that. So if you come up to me and you say, hey, I've got this theory about something in the Bible, I'm glad to hear it, but I'm going to want some scripture. So if you, so if you say, here's what I think, and I'm going to say, great, what would you use as the underpinning to what you think? And if you go, well, I don't have any Bible for it, then I might just, you know, say that's curio- that's a curiosity, but I'm not building any kind of faith on your ideas. Because <laughs> you don't have any Bible for that. I don't have any underpinning. I, I'm just going to take your word for it that, hey, that's what God's saying. Uh, so I need to see something. And so when you, when you start to learn timing, so you got John coming last, and you go, where does John get this idea? Maybe he got a little bit of it from Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul says this, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now Paul writes about two-thirds of the New Testament. And I just showed you the one verse in all of Paul's writings where he gets the closest to calling Jesus a lamb, and not even he does it. You see what he did there? Christ has become Passover. You could argue that Paul doesn't mean Jesus as a lamb at all. You could argue that Paul, who is in the middle contextually of talking about should you observe the Passover or not, is saying to them, well, Christ actually is our Passover. In other words, if you want to celebrate it as a good Jew, go for it. But Christ is your actual Passover. You already have a Passover. It's in your past, and it is done in a man named Jesus. It's awfully close to calling him a lamb because what happened at Passover is they took a lamb into their home and to be very specific on why this was such an important event for Israel, they took a lamb into their home and they inspected it and they made sure that it was spotless and that it was clean and that it was pure. Actually, they they did that before they got home. They, They did that when they bought the lamb or when they raised the lamb. And did you know that under Passover laws, they actually kept the lamb in their house for four days before they slaughtered it at Passover. And that has always really baffled theologians. Why did God make them keep it in there for four days? And I believe it was because God wanted them to fall in love with it as a pet. 
so that the sacrifice of putting that on the altar in their place was real. That it wasn't just some arbitrary animal they picked out and went, oh, let's kill that for our sins. They were literally almost giving a piece of their home and their heart. Every kid in the house had learned to love that little lamb. Can you imagine? You know, imagine, okay, a little tough for you. Imagine that the Passover sacrifice is your dog or your house, your house dog or your house cat. And you go, well, I can't do that. That's the point. <laughs> And so the love had to be at a level that is not going to be from just shelling out dollars at the sheep market, which is what you could do. Just shell out some bucks, give me that one, let's take it, slaughter it. You really put a lot into that. But if you live with it for four days and your kids fall in love with it, then little Johnny's screaming when you take the lamb outside to sacrifice. Now we've got to have a talk in our house. And that's the point, is that we have a talk and that we discuss our heritage and our faith and our religion and why we do what we do. And so that's an aside, but that might help you understand why Paul calls Christ our Passover. And I actually think there's a correlation there. Jesus is here in ministry three and a half years. You could say awfully close to four years, four days enough time for you to fall in love with the Son of God only to watch Him go to the cross and be sacrificed on your behalf. And that's Jesus' question to Peter at the breakfast is, Peter, do you love me? Remember this. Well, you ought to because you and I spent nothing but the last four years together. And of course I love you. Now take that, Peter, and go feed my sheep because it's that kind of passion that I need out of my people. It's that kind of love that I want from a generation that's going to turn the world upside down, which is what Peter is accused of doing in the book of Acts. And you don't become the kind of man or woman that turns the world upside down if you haven't fallen in love with that sheep for four days or fallen in love with that man for four years. That's the, that's the point and the purpose of that, that lamb motif as used in the Passover story. Paul comes close. Paul says, we've got our Passover. But that's not, that's not a lamb. It's really... Maybe John builds off of that. He's also got Peter, who comes really close as well. First Peter, First Peter, chapter two, verse twenty-four, twenty-five. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Remember a moment ago, I, I told you to look at Peter in Acts two, and then look at Peter in First Peter, and you get a guy whose theology jumps to PhD level compared to this thing at Pentecost. I mean, really, his sermon at Pentecost, he grabs a little bit of Joel and throws it on them and then accuses them of killing Jesus. And and there's not a lot of depth there. And the Holy Spirit does the work. And then you get here and he says, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now that's a, that's a cross theology. That's something you can sink your teeth in as you go, Christ actually was doing something at the cross. You weren't just killing Jesus. Jesus was going there as you, that's good Jewish imagery. Now, if you're talking to a Jew, now you're speaking their language because when they, they handed that lamb over to a priest, they were handing that lamb over as if that lamb was themselves. Okay? And so when the priest inspected the lamb, he wasn't inspecting the offerer, he was inspecting the offering. If he inspected the offerer, that's the reason I'm here. I got some sin problems. You don't don't look me over. I'm, you're gonna have to kill me. Look the lamb over, which has no problems. It's dying for me. Problem is the lamb didn't have any say in it. And this is the problem with the law. Okay, your conscience could never really be clean under the law because you know the lamb died against his will. He didn't raise his little paw or little hoof in the air and go, choose me. You, you picked him out and you hugged him and loved him for four days for Pete's sake. And then you killed him on your behalf. And so there was never a real clean conscience. In fact, you probably felt about half guilty for killing the little lamb didn't deserve to die. And so when Christ goes to the cross, what Peter is doing, and, and John's going to do even better through his gospel, is Peter is saying he was going there with my stuff inside of him, my sins in his body on the tree. Having died to sins, we might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the, to the shepherd and overseer or the shepherd and bishop of your soul. So Peter puts his audience in as sheep and says, you were going astray like sheep. Christ died with your problems in him. This is close to him being a, a lamb. Or look at the first chapter, maybe even better. 
1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. There's a lot of good Jewish Judaism in that phrase, aimless traditions received by tradition from your fathers, aimless conduct. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foredained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And here stands in all of the epistles, the closest we get to Jesus as lamb. But even this is Jesus died as a lamb without spot. This is not Jesus is the lamb. This is Jesus as a lamb, but we're getting close. And this is as good as it gets. And in this area, maybe alone, is Peter's theology more well-rounded than Paul's. And that's a rare moment. Pay close attention to that in the epistles. It doesn't happen much that Peter outpaces Paul in an understanding of a Jewish imagery in a Christian world. But John beats them both. And it's a little unfair to give John the title because John gets more revelation than they do. John gets put in prison on the Isle of Patmos. And as he's on the Isle of Patmos, he has a revelation on a Sunday. The Bible says, in the Lord, on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he begins to have revelation. And the book of Revelation should not scare you. And if it is scaring you, my, my theory is, is that you still have a misunderstanding of just how finished the finished work is. And so if you're still scared of revelation, then you're putting the, un- the revelation of Jesus as a future event to be had rather than a past event to be experienced. And there are a lot of Christians who have revelation as a future event to be had in their future and to f- be scared of rather than a-, a past event, an unveiling of Christ that happened within a timeline that you can experience. So start here. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the apocalypto of Jesus Christ, is where we get the word apocalypse, a word we hijacked, because it makes for really good movies to say the apocalypse is upon us, meaning all hell's breaking loose. But that is not what apocalypto means. Apocalypto is simply an unveiling. It's removing a curtain. And so if we have the apocalypto of Jesus or the revelation of Jesus, what we have is not the day Jesus ends at all. We have... Come here, let me show you what he looks like now. You saw him when he was on the earth, John. You saw him resurrection Sunday, John. You stood on the beach with him and Peter, John. Let me show you what he looks like now. And so the book of Revelation is written to seven churches that were existed in that day. And as John, who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, starts to peer into the heavenlies, John sees this in Revelation chapter 5. I want to read a little more than I need, okay? Because I want to lead you up to, with context, this important passage. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And before I read any further, this ought to tell you, even if you think Revelation's out in your future and it's something to be afraid of, and boy, there's a day coming when all those scrolls and trumpets and vials are going to get opened and blasted and poured out and the devil's going to run loose on the earth. If the scrolls were bad, why would John want them opened? And why would heaven weep waiting for them to be opened? And if the enemy is doing it all in some futuristic revelation, then we need Satan to show up right here and show someone how to open scrolls. But the book of Revelation is not the unveiling of the end of the world or the power of the devil. It's the unveiling of who Jesus is. And so John weeps that no one's able to do what needs to be done. But one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So I'm not getting into the seven seals tonight to get into what all they mean. But I want to show you how this happens in John's world. John, this is new for John. John's just standing there on the Lord's day. He's in the spirit, been praying. He gets a revelation. And in this revelation, he starts to see all these images of heaven and and, in the spirit realm. And in this particular vision, 
He finds himself weeping because something needs done and no one in heaven or earth or under the earth. That's a great term for there's nothing in all of the the spirit realm or the natural realm that is able to do what needs to be done. And so John starts to cry and heaven says, don't cry. Someone has done enough. There is someone here who has won, who has prevailed. To prevail, you've been in a fight. Someone here has fought and won and don't worry, he can open it. Who is he? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. You don't get him named here. You don't need him named. You had him named in Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ has spoken to his servant John. So everything about to be revealed to you is in one way or the another associated with the prevalent Jesus, the prevailer, he who fights a battle and wins a battle. But he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Because lions are predators and they hunt prey. And this is an interesting metaphor because it's not always Jesus in the Bible. But when it's the Lion of Judah, it has to be Jesus. We'll show you why in a moment. Sometimes lions aren't good. Remember what Peter said? You have an adversary who goes about like a... Everybody knows that one. Everybody goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so you know that the enemy roars like a lion. It's not The Bible's not trying to confuse you. Sometimes it's Jesus, sometimes the devil. It's just an analogy that a lion is a victor, not a victim. Nothing hunts the lion. That's the point. If we were in the ocean, you might say he's the shark of the tribe of Judah. Nothing hunts the shark, except maybe the killer whale. So he would be the killer whale (laughs) of the tribe of Judah. (laughs) You get the point. You just keep kind of going up the food chain. And so he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. I looked and beheld. Let's go, go to the next one. In the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, what was John told in the previous verses? Don't cry. There's a lion of the tribe of Judah who has prevailed and he's able to open the scroll. And then when John turns to look at the lamb, the lion, what does he see? He sees a lamb as if it had been slain. Let me slow down and say that again. When John turns to look at the lion, what does he see? He sees a lamb as if it had been slain. That is not a misprint. I didn't say it wrong. We didn't type it wrong. We didn't read it wrong. Let me say it again. He's told that it's a lion that can open the scroll. So when he turns to look at the lion, he sees a lamb as if it had been slain. Why is this important? What John is seeing are the images of who Jesus is post-resurrection, post-ascension. He's a victorious lion who's already been in a fight. He's not, but when you turn to make contact with him, when you look at him, you don't see a roaring lion ready for a fight because there's no, nothing left to fight. Instead, you see a lamb as if it is freshly, the Greek word here is as if it is freshly slain. In other words, it's still bleeding. This this has to blow John's mind. He saw Jesus die, and he watched him raise from the dead, and he watched him ascend into the heavens, and he wasn't still bleeding. And then when he sees him in Revelation, the victorious lion, the conqueror of every prey, he's not a lion with big sharp teeth. He expects him to be a lion. He turns to see a lion. He's been told he's a lion. And yet, what does he see? A bleeding lamb. Because for you and for me, an apocalypto of Jesus is not a revelation of Jesus roaring like a lion. For you and for me, a revelation of Jesus is Jesus bleeding out like a lamb, bleeding for our sins, bleeding for our failures, so that our conscience will always be reminded blood has been shed on our behalf. It's been paid for us. We cannot position Jesus as lion. I did all caps on this word because I want you to catch this. We cannot position Jesus as lion or lamb. We must have him as lion and lamb. For John, the lion looks like a lamb that was slain or he looks like a lion who rules as a slain lamb. Just kind of take that in. Let that... 
Because this had to be confusing to John as well, and it's going to be confusing to your spirit man when you first see it. Can you imagine being told, here's the lion of the tribe of Judah, take a look at him. And when you turn to look at him, you don't see a lion at all. You can't find a lion in the room. You see a different animal. Who lied to you? No one lied to you. He is a conquering lion, but he's only effective for you as a lamb. He has no reason to be a lion in your life. There's nothing left for him to fight. There's no devil left for him to beat up. There's no demons left for him to destroy. He has beat everything that can be beaten. The last thing left for him to do is bleed for your sins because you keep committing them and you won't get over them. And you drag the condemnation and the shame and the guilt with you to work and to school and into your relationships and to your deathbed and you need him bleeding constantly for you because without him as a slain lamb, you will forget that that lamb was slain on your behalf. You can call him the lion of the tribe of Judah all you want, but his roar is the sound of the blood of a bleeding lamb. It is not to teach you how to fight, to teach you how to conquer. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, is presented to us as a lamb slain. Now John's gospel gives you lamb Jesus. Where did John get it? So... Who wrote Revelation? John. Who wrote John's Gospel? John. Evidence points to that John writes Revelation. In my, in my view, it's not even close. John writes Revelation before he writes John. And I think the fact that he calls him Lamb of God in John 1, Revelation definitely happened before John because nobody else thought to call him Lamb of God. And then when John's at Patmos on the Lord's Day and he has a revelation, he sees a lamb standing there, bleeding. And it was just described to him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John remembers, I remember John the Baptist called him that one time. Now, I don't know why Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't put that in there, but John puts it in because maybe John remembers, you know, I, I didn't get it at the time. I was there the day John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God takes away the sin. I didn't get what in the world, the lamb of God that takes away the sin. I get it now. I've seen him. He's a lamb, and he's been slain on my behalf. John gives us this, the lion that rules like a lamb. But I want to show you why I think John bought it, okay? Because it's a very Jewish imagery. Remember that root of David business, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the stem of David? Look at Genesis chapter 49. In the the 49th chapter of Genesis, here's a little backdrop for you. The 49th chapter of Genesis, Jacob's about to die. And Jacob calls all of his sons into the room, and he blesses them. Now, he's giving them what effectively amounts to the left-hand blessing. And in, the, in Jewish cultures, there's a right-hand blessing and a left-hand blessing. And the right-hand blessing goes on your firstborn son. And he gets the majority of the inheritance, at least half. And the left-hand blessing goes on all the other kids, and they divvy up the minority. Okay? And so you want the right-hand blessing. Joseph walks his two sons into Jacob, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Manasseh is Joseph's oldest son, and Ephraim is Joseph's youngest son. And he walks them into his father, and he says, Dad, will you give them a blessing? He expects, you know, left-hand blessing, because this is his grandkids. And the Bible says that Jacob crosses his arms over and puts his right arm on the youngest grandson and his left arm on the oldest grandson. And Joseph freaks out and says, Dad, you don't realize what you're doing. You're blind. You're old. I'm patient with you, but we got to start over. And he grabs his dad's arms and he uncrosses them and slaps his hands on the other kid. And the Bible tells us that Jacob tells him, don't do that. I know what I'm doing. And he crosses him back over and he puts his right hand on the youngest and his left hand on the oldest. And he crosses the blessing because it, and it's, it's a dying man's moment of giving the full inheritance to the least deserving And it preludes the cross where Christ will give the fullest blessing to the least deserving. Jesus would call it last, first, first, last. And so after that whole hands over business, Jacob is blessing his sons and he calls them in one at a time. And he says to them, here's going to be your destiny. I'm going to prophesy over you. And Jacob really gives us the greatest way to die in the Bible. Um, I, I've often thought one of the tragedies of the modern theology is that we so fear death, even in Christian circles. We act like we don't. Well, I'm not afraid to die. And then when we get near death, nobody will talk about it with the dying person. 
So we won't go into the hospital room and say, hey, I know that you're going to die. I want to tell you how I feel about you, and I want you to bless my kids. We don't do that in our culture. We're like, don't talk about, especially in the faith culture, we go, don't talk about death. Because if you talk about death, then you're, you're admitting defeat. And we're not supposed to die in Jesus' name. So we're not going to give in to the, to the angel of death. And then your, neighbor, your relative dies, and you didn't get to say goodbye. Because you were trying to be really super holy and pray them back into health. And I think that's tragic. You could be walking into someone who's obviously going to die and walking their grandkids up to them and saying, say something into their lives. That's how your patriarchs handled it. They accepted death, not as a defeat, but as the next, as the step to getting to heaven. (laughs) It was like, I get this last moment of shedding off this coil. And so maybe that'll help somebody who hears that and is facing some sort of situation, but you have, you have the power to speak in the next generation. And so Jacob says, march my kids in front of me. I'm going to die. And I'm sure the kids are like, oh, dad, you're not going to die. And he's like, shut up, come in here, because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in your life. And that's basically how he handles it. And some of it's pretty tough. And some of it's amazing. And some of it doesn't happen for thousands of years. Watch how he talks to Judah. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 8, Judah, you are he whom... Your brother shall praise. Judah means what in the Hebrew? Praise. praise. We all know this from worship service, right? Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. Whelp is a, is a fancy word for uh, cub. We would now call them lion's cubs. But in the old King's English, the word whelp is a, like a, is a baby lion. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, you've gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. This is Judah as lion. First reference in Genesis. Genesis 49. Jacob declares it. Judah, you're a lion. Right now, you're just a little lion. You're just a a little cub, but you're going to grow up. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter. Now, the scepter is the king's scepter. This is that ceremonial garb that declares the king to be the highest judge in the land. This is foreign. This doesn't have anything to, there's no king in Israel. So to talk about one of the Israelites as having a scepter is a prelude to the Israelite who will be on the throne. And they are living in Egypt where the scepter is in Pharaoh's hand. And so they're very familiar with the imagery, but very unfamiliar with the prophecy. So this is coming out for the first time. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh comes, nor a lawgiver from between his feet is a weird way of saying from his loins there shall always be a king or a lawgiver up until the time when Shiloh comes. And then not to it shall be the obedience of the people, but to him. Catch that key word. This identifies Shiloh as a person, not a place. Okay? And to him shall be the obedience of the people. He'll bind his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine, wash his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's a, that's a judgment imagery. And his clothes would be divided, and he rides a donkey into his death. And there's a bunch of this stuff that doesn't even resurface till you get to the Gospels. But Israel goes through their journey, gets a king who comes from... Uh, when David takes the throne... Outside of Saul's family, when David takes the throne, Judah's on the throne. Tribe of Judah, David. And David's family will stay there until the dispersion. There will be no king on the throne when Jesus comes because Israel doesn't have a king. King Herod is a ceremonial title by the Romans, not a, a, a title of nobility that came through birth. So there is no Jewish, there is no Judaic or Jewish king on the throne at the time of Christ. By Christ, by the Apostle Paul and Timothy being declared King of kings, Lord of lords, by the time the New Testament imagery finds Jesus on the other side of the resurrection, they position him as king, fulfilling a Psalm's promise that God said there will always be a kid of David on the throne. How does that happen? Son of David, man named Jesus, and so Jesus becomes the ultimate king. Where, what tribe is he from? Judah. The scepter shall not depart, neither a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. What's Shiloh mean in the Hebrew? Peace. Jesus comes and said, my peace I give to you. Christ comes as prince of peace. As peace arrives, to him shall be the obedience of the people. What, why did I give you this? Well, for one, it's a really cool prophecy of Jesus. But for two, it introduces a lion. Judah, you're a lion, but right now you're just a little lion. But you're going to grow 
Your, your vestige is going to be dripped in blood. The scepter shall not depart when Shiloh gets here. And what is Shiloh? He's peace. And peace and lion don't go together because lions and lambs don't go together. And John sees Jesus in Revelation 5 as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And he looks to see a roaring lion, but he can't find one. Instead, he finds a slain lamb because that's Shiloh. Peace. That perfect marriage of the lion and the lamb. Look at some of the church fathers, because I'm going to show you some Old Testament here in a minute. 375 AD, St. Augustine. I thought this was really cool. This is 400, this is about 300 plus years after Christ, one of the early great writers of the fourth century. Why a lamb in his passion? This is, of course, his passion is his death. Why a lamb in his passion? Because he underwent death without being guilty of any iniquity. Why a lion in his passion? Because in being slain, he slew death. Why is he a lamb in his resurrection? Because his innocence is everlasting. Why is he a lion in his resurrection? Because everlasting also is his might. It's not just poetic, it's theologically correct. Why is he both the lion and the lamb? Well, he has to be the lion or he's not king of Israel. Because remember, Judah's a lion. But he has to be the lamb, otherwise you're not saved. So he has to be this perfect marriage of these two things. This, this. And I'm going to go outside of the scripture, but you're not going to realize it. You'll only realize it because I just told you that. He's the lion that lies down with the lamb. I said that's outside of scripture. That's not in the Bible, by the way. We've all... Heard that our whole lives, like, you know, Bible says the lion will lie down with the lamb. The Bible doesn't say the lion will die, lie down with the lamb. There's not a scripture that says the lion will lie, lie down with the lamb. But there's a scripture that comes awfully darn close. <laughs> and so that's where that came from. Let me show you that awfully darn close scripture, Isaiah chapter 11. Look at this, is verses 1 and 2. Okay, watch this prophecy first, all right? There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 49. Uh, or a lot rather, I'm sorry, a lot like Revelation chapter 5. Remember? Lion, tribe of Judah, stem of Jesse. This is Isaiah, by the way. Revelation won't happen for hundreds of years. Come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, the branch shall grow out of his roots, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Who are we talking about? Jesus, good guess. <laughs> rod from the stem of Jesse, branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay. Uh, let's jump ahead. Again, Isaiah 11, 6 and 9. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. The lion doesn't lie down with the lamb. The wolf lies down with the lamb. The lion's in here, though. Watch, wait for him. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Stay right here. I, I, let's go back there real quick. I, I just want to, it's a bunch of animals together that are just like odd. I mean, leopards and goats and calves and lions and wolves and lambs, but they're all predators and prey. Okay? So you can say lion and lamb lie down together, and although you don't actually have a verse for it, you have you're really close. I mean, you got a wolf lying with a lamb, and you got a lion lying with a fatling. So that's a pretty fat goat slash lamb slash cow slash something that's super fat. <laughs> so we don't know exactly what the fatling is. It could be a lamb that's super fat, ready to be slaughtered. So, but the point of the text is that. The predator and the prey will coexist. A little child shall lead them as a. Sorry. A little child shall lead them as a is an interesting statement because you don't want a little child leading a wolf or a leopard or a lion. So you've injected a character into the story that doesn't belong in 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 the story. Well, I think I'll show you why in a moment. Cow, bear, graze, young ones lie down again. The whole imagery is this impossible scenario. And so a lot of people take Isaiah 11 and they go, there's coming a day, sometime off in the way off in the future where, there, where lions and lambs will lie down together and the leopard won't hunt the goat and the shark won't eat the fish and all the animals will get along together. It'll be a big animal party. And they'll be so calm that a little child can lead them and a nursing child can play on the cobra's den. Next verse. 
And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And there's your key. God prophesies and says, when is this going to happen? When I have myself a holy mountain. And Hebrews comes along and says, you are not at Mount Sinai, but you are at Mount Zion. And Revelation closes and God says, you want to see what the Lamb's bride looks like? And John says, sure, I'd love to see the Lamb's bride. And John turns and the Bible says, and I saw a city come down from God out of heaven called New Jerusalem. In other words, in this holy mountain, this holy mountain, I don't believe is a place out in the future on the planet where dogs and cats live together and, and lions and lambs lie down together. This holy city is the city set on a hill that Jesus called his disciples. It's the holy mountain that you live on. It's the place where he resides. Inside of you, the battle is over between lions and lambs. Inside of you, the perpetual war that has went on from the day you were born should end as you begin to be introduced to who he is. This mountain is alive and well in you. Your lion and your lamb have lied down. You've, you've come at peace. You've, you've come, and if you haven't yet, get reintroduced to Shiloh, the prince of peace. That's the whole purpose of Revelation is to go, he's still a lion to you? When I see him, he's a bleeding lamb. The conquering is over with. The blood has been shed on my behalf. Maybe Isaiah isn't prophesying of a time with no predators or praise, but rather a place. Think of it that way. A place in Christ where the war within our soul finds its peace and finds its rest. Don't think of it as a time. Think of it as a place in Him. And I think we have made the mistake a lot of times with the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah, trying to place them on timelines instead of placing ourselves into that prophecy and realizing that that is happening in us, not outside of us. This is not God worried about whether leopards are going to hunt goats or lions are going to kill fatlings. You are the concern of heaven, not predators and preys in the field. Christ wants to solve the war going on in you. Christ came to die to keep you from killing you. To keep you from fighting you. To keep this battle of predator and prey go that goes on inside of us like the battle of the knowledge of good and evil that's been fighting away in our hearts forever. To solve that problem and bring us into the tree of life. Where in His holy mountain, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth like the waters cover your sea. And in, your, and in the city of your life, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is all that is relevant. The lion is truly lied down with the lamb. Something is happening in you that has brought peace in your soul. When John says, go back to John 1.29, when John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb's job is to solve the sin issue inside of you. The predator sin that's been like the snake in your garden from the time you were born needs to be solved, only can be solved by the sacrificial lamb. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. This is, this is really the culmination of all of church history theology pre-John, sort of married in the moment, taking Jewish imagery of lambs dying that can no longer die because there's no temple for them to die in, and the sin of the world outside of the borders of Israel. This is not just a Jewish thing anymore. He doesn't come to be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of Israel or the Lamb of God to take away the sin of my people. And those are both terms he could have used. John the Baptist saw Jesus as something greater in this moment. Behold, the ultimate Lamb. He's going to take away the sin of the whole wide world. So why does the world keep sinning? This is a bear, it seems like an elementary question, but I think it's still one that worth tackling. I mean, if he takes away the sin of the world, shouldn't he take away people's ability to sin? And if that's your version of theology, you don't understand the heart of God. Christ did not come to be positioned as the Lamb of God to take away your ability to sin. Christ came 
to take away the effectiveness of sin in your life. By being the lamb who is freshly slain in Revelation 5. Why does he need to be freshly? Why is the blood still flowing? I mean, Jesus isn't going to die again. Why does the blood still flow? Well, you and I, we keep failing. We are not failures in God's eyes, but the world keeps moving on. Time keeps rolling. People keep coming into the earth. Christ can't go and die again, but the blood still works. A once for all sacrifice. Not a once for once in a while, but a once for all sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. He doesn't take away people's ability to sin. But Christ has paid the price for everyone's sin. And you and I know, and, and, and John doesn't work on this yet. He will. But the New Testament has already worked on it by the time John comes along. Paul's theology is Paul's done. By the time John writes, John Paul's dead. His theology is in the books, so to speak. And his theology is righteousness by faith and new creation. You are what Christ says that you are. And how did that happen? Because someone died on your behalf. Paul just didn't say it was a lamb. John did. And by speaking that, he speaks back to centuries of lamb killing. And he takes you all the way back to Abel in Genesis who goes before God with an offering and he sheds the blood of an animal and he offers it before the Lord. And Cain comes along and kills his brother. And when Cain kills his brother, Abel's blood splatters to the ground and Hebrews grabs that image in the book of Hebrews and says the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Why did Hebrews say that? Because the blood of Abel had been screaming from the beginning of time and blood is guilt and we all have it. And the blood of Christ comes, the ultimate lamb, his blood is shed and speaks better things than the blood of Abel because the blood of Jesus says, I have avenged Abel's killer. I have paid for Abel's killer. And I think we're even quick to forget that even God marks Cain because God's so merciful marks Cain and lets him go because the heart of God is I'm going to shed blood even for Cain someday. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. I told you earlier about John's insistence of I did not know him, I did not know him. And I think it's John saying, I've known this guy my whole life, but I did not know him as the one revealed to Israel until this moment. I did not know him, but the Lord told me the one to whom you see the Holy Spirit descending upon. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist connects Son of God with Lamb of God, and that's revolutionary. No one had called him Lamb of God, and no one had ever said that the Lamb of God would subsequently be the Son of God. And that is a revelation that you and I take for granted. The Lamb of God is the Son of God. Someone always has to say it first, and John does. And he gets it from John the Baptist. Now, when we move forward, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and just see where, we, see where we've landed in this room. Um, next week, we'll we get into that first disciple passage, and I, we might actually get out of chapter 1 next week. I, I'm not making any promises. I, that's covering an enormous amount of ground. Um, that's starting in verse like 37 and then moving all the way through 51. I don't know if I have that kind of speed in me because there's some really good stuff with Philip and Nathaniel. And then we'll be into water to wine in chapter two. And, uh, that's going to take a while. So, um, hopefully we'll, we'll cover something there next week. Father, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for the word. Thank you for what you've given us. I pray that this is a blessing to your people here and wherever they might access it. Give us a a fresh revelation of the lamb who is freshly slain. And what does that mean? And I, I don't, I want to walk into a greater understanding that the lion is, the lion and the lamb are not at odds. But we are dwelling in a place where you having already been the conqueror, the victor as the lion, now speak to us 
as the ultimate lamb, and there's no condemnation because you are the ultimate lamb. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.